Uh, yeah, we're, we're live. live. We are live, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, take it away, Griffin. Thank, thank you so much, Pat, for setting this up and the the work that you and Yaler and Adam and Barada have all been doing to like make sure this this fork the world hackathon has a. Uh, has uh, like come up with lots of good content has been really impressive. I just got to say, so uh, thank you, thank there's you. so many cool talks. Yeah, I'm, I'm like watching it in the shower uh, every day. So thank you. Um, anyway, so CAD CAD. So today I'm going to talk about CAD CAD, and I just got to warn you, I'm not a developer. Uh, I'm just really inspired by the power that CAD CAD has to change the way that we interact together as, as, as a community, as a community, of, as humanity, honestly. And maybe, maybe I'm overselling it, but you tell me after I get done with my rant, okay? So let's share this screen. And there. I hope that works. Okay, so. Yep. Cool. So yeah, so I'm gonna give you guys an intro to CAD CAD. Uh, we will get our hands dirty with some code and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, even if you don't know how to code, it'll, you'll still be able to copy and paste some stuff and, and learn how CAD CAD works by getting your hands dirty. But I'm gonna start with the why. Uh, CAD CAD is the way that we can start, really start engineering economies. And we need to start engineering economies. And this is, the, this is sort of the common stack mission, right? Because we believe that we have the opportunity to enable communities to develop innovative economies that will reward the creation of public goods. So the people who are creating value in this world right now for our communities, they are not being rewarded adequately for the value they produce. And we'll talk about public goods in a second. But the way the common stack wants to do this is, is a little indirect. We want to create a foundation of tooling and, do and documentation of how to interact with these. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that anyone can build their own economy for their own public good that their community cares about. And uh, if we do this right, if we can create this foundation of tooling and documentation, then everyone can start building off of the work that everyone is doing, and we can start improving these economies iteratively. And this is the common stack mission. So let's, let's get into defining what a public good is. Public goods are a classic example of a market failure, as in our market economy sucks at giving them value. So the, when I say public goods, I actually mean public goods and common pool resources. Basically, anything a government is, is protecting or providing. So there's this kind of, uh, in like economic theory, there's kind of a separation between excludable goods and non-excludable goods. Excludable goods work really well in a market economy. Think of cell phones or cars or cups or tables, right? Anything that you see around you that you consider yours and yours alone, or anything that can uh, be collectively used, but at the same time, there's a fence built around it. Anything that you can exclude people from is considered an excludable good, right? A non-excludable good would be like the forest or air or a river. You know, there, there's a, it's really difficult to build a fence around these things. And because of that, uh, because it's hard to build a fence, it's hard to create customers because they, they, they succumb to what is known as the free rider problem. If you can't exclude people from using this good, then people are just going to come in and use it uh, to their own. They're going to overfish the ocean. They're going to cut down too many trees. They're going to pollute the air because there's no way to really stop them. It's non-excludable. And our solution to that as a society has generally been governments, to a lesser extent nonprofits, but for the most part, uh, non-excludable non -excludable economic goods are provided by governments. And uh, in fact, it's gotten so crazy that this is like the dominant uh, manner for providing public goods to society, that in the 60s, uh, Gary Hardin wrote this paper called Tragedy of the Commons, 
where he said that, you know, this is the only way to provide non-excludable goods to society. We need big governments to actually solve this problem for us. But then along came a beautiful woman named Eleanor Ostrom, who actually won a Nobel Prize in economics for disproving Gary's theory uh, and saying the tragedy of the commons doesn't have to be a tragedy. So, uh, and I'll explain in this, she said it well in this quote, there is no reason to believe that bureaucrats and politicians, no matter how well-meaning, are better at solving problems than the people on the spot who have the strongest incentive to get the solution right. That's right, Eleanor. You got it, right? So we don't need, governments are not the only solution. And uh, Eleanor Ostrom spent decades researching and finding communities that solved the tragedy of the commons themselves without any government uh, playing a role. They self-organized. Her contemporary, David Boyer, uh, Set, defines commons really well. And, and, and really, this is, and I love this quote that he says where the next big thing will be a lot of small things. Because with commons, we can actually, instead of having one large government that monopolizes every public goods vertical, right? And they, they hold the space for all of the commons all at once, and you have to elect some crazy dude to be the manager of every single, of education, the environment, uh, military, uh, you know, defense and safety, uh, you know, regulating the pharmaceutical industry. Like every commons is controlled by this one guy. That's crazy. And, and that's not the most efficient way. As Eleanor said, the people on the ground are the best ones to manage this system. And so the next big thing will be a lot of small commons that can start replacing the need for these lines that are doing an okay job of providing public goods, they're doing okay, uh, but they can be done better with small groups of people who really know what, the, what their, their community needs. And uh, the way to support a public good is to create a commons around that resource. So David Boyer, uh, in this picture, he defined common, this is the best definition of a commons I've ever heard. It's a little bit in the negation, but I think it's important. A commons is neither the resource, the community that gathers around it, nor the protocols for its stewardship, but the dynamic interaction between all these elements. And this is where CADCAD comes in, because as you can see, the, the dynamic reaction, uh, the, the dynamic um, situation around this resource, whatever the resource is, whatever the public good is, whatever the shared resource is that we're going to talk about, is dynamic and complex with many actors. And designing a protocol for a given community around that resource can get a little bit complicated. And uh, let's see, who's got their mic on? <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. Okay, so uh, there's another, uh, besides Eleanor Ostrom and David Boyer, who come from the, the ec social economics area, there's another innovation that I think really can add value to the commons, and this is blockchain tech. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto found a way to create a, a, an alignment of incentives around a global payment system. I would consider Bitcoin a commons. It's an open global payment commons. And using blockchains, a uh, magical ability to issue currency for, uh, in, in all these examples, for sharing computing power in a network is a, a really great example of aligning incentives uh, for the individuals as well as the network itself. Uh, Zcash is a great example of a commons. It's a zero-knowledge knowledge commons, and that's not a typo, right? So Zcash uses 20% of their mining reward to just fund cryptographers to work on zero-knowledge uh, uh, research. Uh, they've created some amazing uh, things on Z uh, ZK Snarks and have pushed a lot of really powerful libraries uh, that the Ethereum community has been able to capitalize on and, and loop into their stuff. That, it never would have been possible. We would not be where we are in rollups and identity management and a lot of other processes without Zcash actually funding these cryptographers. I mean, you can do crazy commons. You, I mean, PrimeCoin funded 
the they they use the block reward to get people to find prime numbers. We no one even cares about prime numbers, and yet they created a commons around it. Okay, this is this is a huge opportunity for incentive alignment. And so the common stack dream is to take this blockchain incentive alignment and bridge it into the physical world that the commons that Elner Ostrom and David Bullier and all the commons experts are talking about when they and uh, the, the challenge is that in the blockchain space, it's a very tech-focused space. In the physical world, we have to uh, deal with a lot of politics and a lot of community people and a lot of cultural issues. And so Common Stack is trying to bridge this gap and create what we call cyber-physical commons. And uh, this is going to take a level of maturity that currently doesn't exist in the blockchain space. I hate to say it, you know, but we we don't value the 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 fact we don't appreciate the fact that open global blockchain based economies are like bridges. They are public infrastructure that are difficult to change once deployed. So we need to treat these things like public infrastructure. We need to take care that people when they use them, they don't get hurt. Or that when we deploy them, they don't have negative uh, repercussions to the, to the systems that we're trying to protect. And so we should really look at bridges and how bridges are designed and, and deployed and launched and study how and other public infrastructure and follow that model. And to do that, we need CAD CAD. We have to actually validate our designs before we launch them. That's the general idea. And this is, uh, this is my background as a chemical engineer. We were, building, uh, we were building factories, right? And we built the whole factory in a computer before we'd strike ground. That's just how things work. And that's, and that's what you have to do when you're building public infrastructure that could hurt people after it's deployed and it's very difficult to change. So this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. I'm sure that they use simulations of some sort before they actually created this bridge, right? Uh, but uh, they didn't know about wind resonance. No one knew about wind resonance when they built this bridge, and so they didn't design for it. However, this has never happened again since, <laughs> because, because everybody knows about it, and they built it into the simulation. So now we have, when we're building bridges, we, ha we know that this could happen, and so we make sure that we test the, the potential for this situation. We want to do the same thing with economics. And I know that's crazy, right? You can't simulate economies. Uh, this has been said many times, and we can go into that later if you want. But uh, with blockchain tech, there is a lot of opportunities to create limitations in the systems where it can be simulated. And uh, I'll show you some, uh, some examples in a second. But this is the common stack approach. And CAD CAD is the foundational layer to make it all work. Uh, we start with a model of all of, we model all of our components in CAD CAD. We deploy them live. And then we get feedback on those models. We improve the models. We give that to the open source community so they can take those models make a couple of tweaks, improve them from what they've seen, customize them for their own communities, and then deploy again. And then, yeah, we merge upstream again, and we continually iterate on these models until we have public good economies that can actually support the needs of humanity uh, around these public goods. But CAD CAD is not that easy to do, honestly. It's a lot of work. And, and so, uh, I'm going to explain the process of, of creating a CAD-CAD model from scratch. Uh, but just remember, the goal of the common stack is to make this a copy-paste solution for anybody who wants to support public goods. That's our mission. This is our goal. And we're going to get there. But we got to start somewhere. And we, got, we have almost a, a blank slate. So we're, it's going to take some time. But let's, let's start talking about CAD-CAD. I'm giving you the why. Let's talk about the how, right? So the first thing that you have to do is actually write down your design. I know it's hard, but designing an economy is not a hackathon project. 
at least if it's actually going to interact with the physical world, it can't be a hackathon project. You have to take it with some respect and you have to sit down and spend some time and write down your system design, write down a spec, get all the pieces figured out on paper. And then once you think you've filled all the holes in your design, that's when you can start validating in CAD CAD. So after you have your initial design scoped out, you figure out all the math that it requires. Write down all the little equations. It's just a lot easier to do this all at once in advance. It, I mean, there's no wrong way to make a CAD CAD model, okay? I'm not trying to say this is the only way to do it, but this is the way that the professionals like at Block Science recommend, and so I just have to do them, right? And the way, the way it's been explained to me is it's a lot easier to just focus on math and and get it all down on paper and then move on from there. And once you have all the math down, it, you can really finalize your, your stock and flow diagram. This is a stock and flow diagram of the, of the base, kind of an overview of the common stacks, uh, initial commons design. The augmented bonding curve, the blue lines represent how the die moves in the system. The green line represents how the, uh, how the tokens move in the system, how they're used to vote. The yellow lines uh, represent value, actual value, public goods value, which is difficult to measure. It doesn't have a token, but it's still a value in our system. So this is the value flow. And the cylinders represent the states of the system, the, the metrics that we can use, the numbers. We can say there are this many tokens. There's this much die in escrow for this proposal. There is this much die in the bonding curve, right? So we can uh, represent the stock and flow using, uh, we use lucid chart for this one. And then this, this is very underrated. It's, this is the map. Once you have the stock and flow, you have the math, you have the overall design. Now, we can start breaking it up so it's easy to, to describe the CAD-CAD model that you're going to build. So you can kind of connect all the pieces. So this is a, a mechanism diagram. And so if you look in the middle row, right, the, right here, I think you can see my mouse. Uh, these are the mechanisms. These are the things that change the state. On the bottom, we have the states. On the top, we have the mechanisms, the things that change the states. And on the top, we have the behaviors. The behaviors are where things get interesting. These are generally called policies in, in CAD CAD. And the policies uh, will say like, oh, why would someone vote, right? Well, someone will vote if they're happy with the system. If they like what they see the, uh, enough to engage with the system, then they'll probably also vote and they'll vote for the proposals that they like. Right, and then so you code up that actual behavior, and that's what makes CAD CAD so cool because we can start actually creating uh, social economic systems in code. Uh, it this doing this map will save you time if you can do this map before you start your CAD CAD project uh, um, coding. This will save you time. But let's actually, so once you have the map, let's look at some code. So here's an example. Is Andrew here? I think uh, a Andrew actually coded this up. I don't think he's here today, right now. But uh, uh, this is an example of, in the common stacks rewrite of Zargum's awesome code for the conviction voting, uh, for, the commons, uh, for the common simulator project that we're working on. This is a, a function that we wrote up. So I'm just going to go slowly through it so you can see the magic of CAD CAD. The name of this function is very clear. Participants buy more if they feel good and vote for proposals, right? This is, the, this is the, actually a state update function. So uh, it, it references some policies, it references some mechanisms, and every, and every time we go into a new time step in the CAD-CAD simulation, these, these simulations are based on time steps. So every time you go through a new time step, you call this function and you say, okay, at this time, you know, what happens? So uh, we're given a network of participants 
and proposals. And we have a sentiment sensitivity. The, sens the sentiment is how does each participant feel about the network, right? Uh, and the sensitivity to how they feel, this is, uh, this is a parameter that we put in for modeling it. And so then you run through, in this time step, you run through all of the participants that are in the given network. And the first thing we do for each participant is we actually measure their engagement rate. It's like, what is the probability that they will even look at the, the DAO, at the commons, right? Why will they even care about the commons on this day? Because each time step for us is a day. So uh, we multiply by 0.3 their sentiment, and then we uh, create a probability engagement uh, where their sentiment, uh, if it's above a random number, uh, if their sentiment times 0.3 is above a random number, then maybe they'll look at the DAO that day, right? They'll, they'll go to the website. That's, that's the first, first thing. Will they engage? And then if they engage, then we move over here. I'll talk about this one in a second. We move over to uh, support. Uh, oh, maybe I'll read some of these comments, right? So the, the, just to go back, the whole idea here is that the higher the participant's sentiment, the more likely they will interact with the commons. They will change their holdings, as in buy more tokens, according to their sentiment. Then they will vote on their favorite proposals, uh, although how much they like the proposals also determines on how many proposals they will vote for. And if they don't choose to interact, they, they will just do nothing. So the engagement is here, right? Now, if someone engages, then they will actually, they will actually put their tokens and stay, oops, they will stake their tokens in a given proposal. And, uh, and then we calculate their affinity. So, uh, so once, we, once we've decided that this, Particip this participant actually wants to engage, then we uh, calculate their affinity for each proposal, or we grab their affinity for each proposal. Like how, uh, when we started this system out, we actually gave everyone an initial affinity for a proposal. Every time a proposal is created, we, uh, we give every participant a random number that represents how much they like that proposal. And so here uh, we created what Zargum called a polarized distribution, which when I Googled, I couldn't find anything of what that meant. Uh, but uh, it's a really cool distribution. I don't know if Z just made it up or what. But uh, so it basically means that about half of the proposals, the participant won't really care about. They'll have an affinity smaller than 0.25. So for about half of the proposals, they don't care, right? But then there's a kind of a curve of uh, how much they like these proposals. And a few of them they'll really care about. They'll have an affinity of like eight or nine. So most of the affinities are below 0.25. And then there's a, a few of the affinities that, that go up all the way to eight. And as you get higher, there's fewer and fewer of those affinities. This is kind of the distribution, which I think models how much people would like a lot of proposals, right? Uh, it was a re it's a really nice distribution that probably describes how people would feel if you have a bunch of proposals in front of you. And so then uh, we start, we take their affinity and we do some crazy stuff with it, okay? Uh, we basically, Let's see, what do we do? We find the max affinity that anybody, that this participant has for all of the proposals. If their max, if the, high, if the proposal that they have the most affinity for is above 0.5, uh, if it's less than 0.5, then we do nothing. If it's above 0.5, then they, then they vote for that proposal, right? But there's, there's some cool creative move here where, it, he kind of picks the top one to, to five proposals that are above 0 0.5. And then, uh, and then if like 
if the first, if the, to his top proposal has an affinity of eight, we'll say, then, uh, then they'll only vote for the next affinity if it's close. They'll only vote for the next proposal if the affinity is going to be higher than four. I, I'm sorry I couldn't describe this well, um, but it, it's, a very, it's a pretty complicated uh, little equation that he put together in just one line. Where it's like you're going to vote for your favorite proposal uh, as long and probably a couple more as long as you like them uh, more than half as much as you like your top proposal. This is this is the little line. I don't know if that made sense, but and then uh, but we'll keep going. And so then also if you have this high affinity for some proposals, then you're also going to buy more tokens. Okay. So this was a, uh, a time step. This was one small function in a CAD CAD, uh, in a CAD CAD, uh, in, a, in, a real, in a real simulation that we're doing for uh, an actual important project. And as you can see, it's a lot of work. However, if you can understand this code and read it and copy paste and tweak it for your own uh, project, then you don't have to do all that work. We just have to do it once because the coolest thing about CAD CAD is it's open source and everything that it touches is, is open source. So now CAD CAD is not just for design though. What you can do with your CAD CAD models after you've actually launched the product is probably the coolest part. Once you start tweaking it and you have the model actually have a relatively accurate representation of, of what you're doing uh, of your system, then you can use it to project the future, right? You can start doing A-B tests on governance. You can say, okay, if we, you know, if we, uh, like in MakerDAO, if we up the, you know, the interest rate to 2% on DAI, uh, then, or on Ethereum, then on Ether, then, you know, what will happen to the system? And you can run 10 million simulations on if you, if you make that decision and 10 million simulations on if you don't. And then you can look at the worst case scenarios. You can start, maybe, if you, maybe yeah, there's this problem if you up it to 2%. So if you're going to do that, then you need to add this uh, thing and this thing to mitigate potential failures, failure modes. And, and this is called computer-aided governance. Jeff wrote an amazing blog post that explains it with digital twins and such. But I'm a little over time, so, and I want to get to the code. So, But just know that... The design aspect of the model is just the first cool thing that, and why it's important. The next step is, is even crazier. That's when we start getting into machine learning governance. But let's get our hands started. Let's get started. Okay, so we're just going to dive into it. So uh, let me just share these links. If you don't have the link, I will post it in the workshop discussion discord channel it's right here so this is the uh this is the robots and marbles tutorial it's it's really fun they've been using it for almost a year now oh probably over a year and uh so check that V2, uh, Baradis says V2 of this workshop for machine learning governance would be awesome. It's true. Uh, we have to get some models that actually match governance systems first. But, uh, so, get, uh, go to the uh, workshop discussion channel and, and click this link. And then also click this link. This is Google Colab. Google, you know, I have my qualms with Google, but I have to say, Google Colab is pretty incredible. Uh, I don't know why they're going to let us run CAD CAD on their servers, because it's pretty heavy, and it's really hard to set up. But we can DOS Google right now by, uh, by running CAD CAD uh, on, on their system. It's very kind of them. So the first thing when you get into Google Colab, you just want to put in this exclamation mark pip space install space cad cad 
And every time you put something in the Google Colab, I recommend just hitting play. OK, now I'm going to wait and let people get set up. Uh, is, anyone, is anyone stuck? Did everyone find the links? Does anyone need any help before we start this? Still trying to get the link. You know, I can also share this. Uh, I'm sorry about the rant and then the lack of questions. I will uh, go for questions once I get everyone started in the tutorial, and then we can ask questions if you'd like. So uh, what we're going to do now is, if you have, the, if you have all these links, the link to the Robots and Marbles tutorial, the, the link to Google Colab, and you've put pip install CAD CAD in the Google Colab, now we're just going to run through the very first, uh, the, just the very first Robots and Marbles tutorial. And if you run into any problems, if you're going really fast and you're a CAD CAD superstar, I pasted the Discord link for CAD CAD. They have a help channel, and there's lots of superstars over there that would love to support anybody who wants to learn how to use these tools. Uh, it's a really friendly community. So does anyone still need a second to get Google Colab up, the demo up? OK, I'm going to keep going then. OK, so this is Robots and Marbles. The basic story is that you have a robot, a little robot arm. And this robot arm is moving, money, is moving marbles from one box to another. The robot arm is not, it's, this is not an AI-controlled robot with machine learning, blah, blah, blah. No, it has one rule. If, the, if one box, it moves marbles from the, from the box that has the most marbles to the box that has the least marbles, right? That's it. There's only two boxes. So if the boxes have an even amount of marbles, then it doesn't do anything. It turns off. Its, it's goal is to get an even number of marbles in each box. So when you're going through CAD CAD, there's certain terminology that's used, right? The first terminology is state variables. This is any kind of variable that describes the system, right? The number of tokens, the number of marbles, uh, whatever, right? Anything you can put a number to it, this is a state variable. So the first thing we're going to do is actually create the state variables, the initial state of the system. And in this, in this test, there's just one state. Uh, so every time, uh, so we're going to go back and forth between Google Colab, and every time you want to put a, a new block of code in, you just hit plus code, and you paste it in. Now, technically, you don't have to do that, but I think it's really easier because you save a lot of copy-paste errors uh, because you can just hit play, and it'll tell you if you screwed up. So we just uh, notice I hit play on pip install CAD CAD, and it gave me all this stuff. Now I'm pasting in the initial conditions, which say that box A has 10 marbles, and box B has zero marbles. I wonder what the robot arm is going to do. OK, so uh, the next thing that's important to know is time steps. Right? In a simulation, I said this earlier, you have, you, you're running through time. So you have a, a set a system that is experiencing time one step at a time. And you don't have to do anything. That's just done in the background of CAD CAD. It just does this stuff automatically for you. But every time you step through time, you want to update the states, all the state variables. So they have what, what is called, uh, so, well, OK. And to update the states, you have the mechanisms. Right? And so this is the first mechanism. In this mechanism, you have to update the state of box A and update the state of box B. So at each time step, uh, you will, if, if box A is greater than the number of marbles of box B, then you subtract a marble from A. If box a is less than box B, then you add a marble to A. 
that's it. This is what happens to update uh, the A box. And the exact same thing is what happens to update the B box. So let's just add that. These are the mechanisms. Remember that, uh, that roadmap uh, flow doc, that, the picture that we had, the middle row? These are the mechanisms. You just take a marble from box A. If it has more marbles, and you remove and you add a marble to box B if it has less marbles, and vice versa. So we hit play, and let's go to the next one. So now that we have some mechanisms, now we can do a partial state update block, right? So at each time step, we need to actually tell CAD CAD to apply these mechanisms. So these are called, uh, this is, this is a kind of a default thing that goes, that you're going to need for every CAD CAD thing. It's uh, just a, defining a partial state update block. And we don't have any policies. The, like I said, the, the robot arm is not some kind of AI decision-making uh, robot. It's just a dumb robot that is just moving marbles around. So it doesn't have any uh, behavior that we have to worry about. So we just put this one in here, plus code. And play it. Make sure I didn't make a typo. And then now we actually, uh, this is another pretty standard CAD CAD piece where we define how we want to run the simulation. So how the simulation's parameters, there are three main parameters. There's T, which is how many time steps are we doing. There's N, which is the number of simulations we want to do. And then M, which I'll just skip. So let me just do it here and hit play. Make sure I didn't get a copy paste error. Great. So this is going to do one simulation with 10 time steps. And now this is another pretty default CAD uh, CAD configuration step where you just paste this one in and uh, it does, it starts running some. Uh, some partial state update blocks, taking the configurations that you have above. And of course, there's a lot more detail than what I'm putting in here, but it's all written in the tutorial. So feel free to go back, go a little slower than I'm going. And then this is where we actually make the action happen. This is where we generate the data. So let's put this in here. And honestly, you, uh, I've, never, I've never actually played with any of this stuff or changed any of this stuff. A lot of this stuff, you can, uh, if you want to start creating your own system, you can start with this tutorial and just change the mechanisms, change the policies, and you can figure out and tweak this stuff when you get to it. When you, like, all of a sudden you need to, to start doing more complicated things. So uh, CAD CAD, so once I post put this in and played, there is now a bunch of data behind this simulation. And now it's time to use all the Python magic to extract the data into, uh, into something that people can read, right? Instead of just being data behind. So the first one is uh, importing pandas, which, which is a, a Python library, and then just Execute showing the data, right? So, okay, we ran the simulation. There's a robot arm. It has 10 marbles here, zero marbles in box B, and it's moving one marble at a time. Okay, that looks right. We luckily, and then once it gets to five marbles, boom. Okay, very simple system. The robot arm can go to sleep. No need for you anymore, robot. Okay, now what if we want to change some? Oh, oh, actually, sorry. Let's make it fun and pretty. We want a graph. Everyone loves graphs. Ooh, pretty graph.
And okay, so now what if we want to change something? So instead of copy and pasting this code, I'm going to go crazy. I'm not going to do it. I'm actually going to just go up here and change the initial state. Oh, yeah, that's right. I just coded. Uh, so now instead of the box A starting with 10, we're going to start with 11. And we're going to go up here and run all under runtime. And so now it's going to do this CAD CAD, like re-download CAD CAD, which is probably a waste of time. But look, now it ran through all these steps. And oh, because there's an uneven thing, the robot is going to waste electricity forever moving marbles around. Ah, that sucks. Don't start with uneven numbers of marbles. That's the, that's the lesson from the first tutorial. So we can tweak other things too. The cool thing about this tutorial is it's very basic. You can just go through it and see what it shows you, but you can also start playing around. You know, what happens if we have more time steps? What does that mean? Let's make this range uh, 17. Okay. Uh, run this actually with runtime all. And then what does the chart look like? Does that change anything? Oh, no, it just makes it bigger. It just runs for more time. Kind of cool, right? Now, in the next tutorial, things get really exciting because we can start actually mapping behavior. So in the tutorial here, you can just go up to tutorials. And we all owe James Zaki uh, a round of applause for making this uh, tutorial useful. Thank you, James. Uh, CAD CAD had some major updates, and he went through and actually uh, fix the tutorials to work with the updates. So Zaki's a hero. But in the next tutorial, uh, if you want to keep playing, which we have the time, and you're more than welcome to just dive in, we're actually going to introduce a policy. So in, in the policy, uh, well, I'll let you guys read it and figure it out. But feel free to keep working. Uh, on these, on this, we have another 15 minutes. Um, let's see here. And uh, everyone who's actually interested in doing these tutorials, go wild. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let's go to the, the actual help room on Discord, uh, in the CAD CAD Discord, and uh, ask there, because I'm probably not the best person to actually answer your questions. So. But I am the best person to answer any other questions that you might have about CAD CAD in general and, and the common stack. So thank you. Uh, any questions? We possibly You're in ones and zeros. I was just going to um, jump in and, and I mean, sometimes I, I finish with, uh, you know, the robots and marbles tutorial and the question from people are, um, you know, what, why are we simulating a robot and marbles? You know, what, what, is the, what does this tell us about crypto economic systems and whatnot? Um, and I think the, um, the answer to that, um, you know, why, why are we working with these kinds of, um, you know, layered uh, simulations is to show that uh, simple mechanisms don't necessarily compose. So when Griff was going through those examples, you know, we had a simple example of one robot moving a marble, um, or a simple mechanism, sorry. Then we, then we introduced a second simple mechanism of another robot moving marbles, and all of a sudden the system dynamics were, were nonlinear and, and unpredictable. Uh, so this is basically a way that we can show that um, you know, simple mechanism plus simple mechanism does not make simple system. Uh, and this speaks to the need for CAD CAD as a modeling tool uh, to, to um, understand the complex dynamics of systems with multiple mechanisms. And those mechanisms could be, for example, uh, conviction voting um, and quadratic voting. Hey, both of those work on their own, but when you combine them, what happens? We need to simulate in CAD CAD. So the, the robot and marbles tutorial is a great simple example of what happens when you introduce uh, multiple layers of simple mechanisms, one on top of the other. Exactly. And this is why we would have a much safer Ethereum if all of DeFi was modeled, right? All of a sudden, someone comes up with the idea of flash loans and, you know, hey, flash loans work fine on their own. 
right? But then when you combine it with uh, Fulcrum, who is getting their, uh, you know, their price feed from Uniswap, and now you can do a, a flash loan on Uniswap and uh, mess with Fulcrum, uh, you all of a sudden steal a bunch of money from a lot of people, a lot of innocent lenders. So uh, this, is, this composability is some of the magic of CAD CAD. If everyone had an open source CAD CAD simulation, we could actually predict a lot of potential issues before they happen. When flash loans get launched, they had a simulation of the entire Ethereum ecosystem, which is a huge ask. Well, we could actually, uh, before they get launched, they could have gone to the Fulcrum guys and said, hey, uh, like this is going to wreck your system. You better fix it. And at least they would have known. Now, whether or not they fix it, hey, that's a whole nother deal, but at least they would have known. Cool. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to speak up, but honestly, it's better if you're just working quietly on CAD CAD. I'm going to start doing the next Robots and Models tutorial too. So in the second one, they basically, you can just do it at the bottom of the first one. How do you find working on Google Colab Griff? Does that suit your purposes? Do you, do you think there's... Oh, yeah. um, yeah, it's it's good. It over uh, have you tried the local environment? I'm just curious, like the user interface of Colab versus um, uh, doing the, the mean, not everything. So the problem with the local environment is getting it set up on everyone's machine for a tutorial. It's like you just it just breaks. Everyone has a special machine, you know. Someone's running Arc Linux, and it's like oh, you know, okay, well. Sorry, hacker dude. You're going to have to figure this out on your own. And that's not really a great attitude to have. Whereas when you throw it on Google Colab, everything just works. All you need to worry about is putting the exclamation mark pip install CAD CAD. And then everyone's living in the same perfect environment. And <laughs> your computer is running great. It's not trying to run CAD CAD. Google's doing it for you. I mean, you're dosing Google servers while playing with CAD CAD. It's great. It's amazing. Exclamation. So you add exclamation point pip install CAD CAD at the beginning, and then it should be good to go, hey? Yeah, that's it. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that's this. If anyone is interested in installing a local environment, uh, Tyler Mace, who's in this call, helped me walk through it for, for Windows the other day, and it was awesome. I feel like even though it's the most basic uh, Git commands, I feel like a coding god. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to run a um, uh, short um, install session before the CAD CAD uh, conviction voting workshop next Wednesday. Um, so if anyone wants to uh, get some tips on installing uh, local Python environment and CAD CAD on your local machine, it is a bit of a learning curve, but it's not too bad as long as you don't run into uh, any of those install glitches. 
Um, but I mean, Google Colab is also a great uh, option for uh, tutorials and, and online collaboration as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the only option for a tutorial like this, but I assume that if you really want to be a professional and, and like, make this happen, yeah, you set up your own local environment. Ideally on a DAP node or something, though, so it doesn't slow down your machine. Right, Edu? Yeah, and as Jeff mentioned, really the, the second Robots and Marbles tutorial is where things get kind of cool, because now you have two robot arms. You turn a robot arm into a policy, and you can have two or ten of them. You have a request yeah. in the channel to follow up with a machine learning governance session, Griff. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was. I would. L I can't wait to see. Uh, source SourceCred has a CAD CAD instance going, right? I'm pretty excited to see how that pans out and if they can uh, start really once once that the problem with. Um, computer-aided governance, and, and I think it's going to take a long time, is that we actually have to get these models uh, good enough that they, they are predicting the actual behavior. So first step is to have something running that has an accurate model behind it, and then an accurate enough model behind it. And then when that thing is running, you take all the data you can gather, and you use it to tune the model so that it's matching the data and ideally predicting behavior to some degree. Uh, and then, once, once that has been iterated on a few times, then we can start doing the cool stuff with the computer-aided governance. But it's going to take time. But we have to start somewhere. Here we are. We have the open source tool to do it. We have, the foundation has, has been poured. We just got to let it settle and start building on it. Uh, and this Robots and Marbles tutorial, you know, it's, it seems really basic and simple. But by the end of this, you're building an entire network of, uh, yeah, basically, you've, you can almost take a robot, Robots and Marbles uh, net, uh, system and create something pretty similar to a crypto economic system. And, yeah, I, I, I honestly think that CAD-CAD simulation, it's going to be like the next smart contract auditing. 
the way DeFi is going and the way that the whole uh, system, the, the, the way that our community is maturing and coming around to the fact that we need to start validating designs, it's going to be one of those things where you, wouldn't, you, you would almost require, everybody who writes smart contracts is almost required to have an audit. It's just a cultural norm. And in a few years, I'm predicting personally that it will be a cultural norm to also have a CAD CAD model representing your system and ensuring that it's not going to break everything else that's already there, ensuring that the incentives are actually aligned and th that you can prove to somebody with your CAD CAD model that it's not just some kind of crazy Ponzi scheme because uh, uh, that's, that's the way. This would, this would be a great way to prove it. And it's also a great way to prove that you can actually create material value in this world, not just like, oh, hey, yeah, we can make some money, right? Oh, that's great. That, but money is just some weird abstract concept that doesn't really provide value in itself. We need to figure out a way to turn this like money game into creating value. And I think the best way to iterate and improve those systems is CAD CAD. And then we can start actually create, creating systems that don't just create money for money's sake, but create value for humanity. So anyway, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and I hope you enjoy your CAD CAD tutorial. Thank you, hey, thank you very much. It was super. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Pat, for uh, hosting us and recording this. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Glad to do it. Thanks, Griff. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye, bye guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.